Okay, now welcome traders to the training session. Now using probability enhancers. Now what I call probability enhancers, it's a better name for, instead of using indicators, right? Because what we are looking to do, like generally speaking, this is my chart, right? We've got support and resistance trend lines. You can see very clearly um, where they are and what's going on. But you know what? Sometimes, you know, you've, you've got your, your sort of key say resistance and support levels. And then at the bottom, we only ever really had uh, one indicator, right? And it was uh, the relative strength index, which sort of got superseded by stochastics, right? Same thing, a um, bit more, bit new, fresh, bit more tech in there. And what we're trying to do is, as it approaches these, uh, these trend lines, we're sort of trying to gauge momentum. Now, this is, uh, it's interesting, right? Because stochastics, we only really used to be using that. And don't forget, the, the markets used to be a lot more gentler trending markets, right? They're, they're sort of almost become very violent, the, the movements, because, and, and that's obviously to do with market conditions. We've got like seven central banks sort of on hold, ready to cut rates and then not, and then ready and not. So we're getting these violent moves, right? Stochastics in those situations doesn't really come into play. Where it does come into play is where there isn't any major, um, like a, just a normal trending day where there's not much data, like today, right? And this is where you can start to look around and you go, all right, well, I've got a, a, a trend line here. Do I buy or sell? And we're using stochastics, say it's an overbought situation, to potentially either manage positions or give you the probability enhancer to get into that trade, right? But there are other things you can use. And we had sales guys, right? This is where the indicators really came into light in the banks. The sales guys are talking to clients, right? They don't really want to say, listen, it's a bit overbought or it's a bit oversold. They might use that in a discussion if it was close. But say, for instance, it was um, if we're looking at, at an instrument and it's sort of mid-range here, well, they've got to like, like if you're talking to a corporate, right? Say you're talking to um, an airline, like one of the big airlines like Qantas out here in Australia. Um, they're like, you know, we've, we've got to cover like, you know, 200 million Aussie. We've got to buy some yen or US or whatever it might be. Like what's going on? Tell me what's going on. Because the guys at the corporations, unlike the fund managers, don't know a lot about what's going on. So they need to give them a story. And this is where indicators sort of evolve from like the the one that a lot of the um um the guys used to use if i just come into here was bollinger bands right they we just be like i used to hear them on the phone all the time just going oh well you know the high today is going to be uh you know where we are now it's not going to go any higher and it's the low could be down here somewhere right it was this this um when the bollinger bands became sort of prevalent right across for, for, for storytelling. Now, it's supposed to give you an indication, but the, th the damn thing lags, right? So, and it's not, I mean, you might think it's accurate. It's, it's for specific market conditions. Now, is this going to improve your probability of an overall trade here? Well, I'll tell you what, if you're looking at opportunities here, you know, where you've got, um, say, the bands, right? That's supposed to be the top end of the level and that's supposed to be the low end. And that's... They're saying that that's the range for what where this thing could go right now. Obviously, if there's any economic numbers, it blows the blows these things out. Okay, and then you get a big uh, disparity in the actual band itself. But the um, what they would generally be saying, right? And this is different to what we're doing as a trader. They'd be like, yeah, you know, and, and not even really referencing the trend line, but they'd be saying, okay, so you're long dollars. Look, you want to be selling, uh, say, around this, um, you know, 108, uh, well, 60, 60, 65 on euro. Uh, that looks like the top of the band at the moment. And they'll be like, what, you, what band? And they'll be saying, oh, you know, we've got this magical indicator and it tells us where the market's going to stop. Well, it doesn't really, right? Because if you're using this day in, day out, yeah, it might work sometimes. But look at the situation here. If you're like, yeah, this is the top of the band, right? I'm going to get short here, okay? It doesn't really line up yet with an over, over, so over bought situation. Uh, it gets short here and it's up, it's up, it's up, it's up. 
and still in the band. It's like you're moving the goalpost as you're actually watching it. And you can actually get hammered using Bollinger Bands. Great for salespeople, not great for traders. But this is where, you know, for specific market conditions, and I'm not going to promote you use all these different indicators, but where the Bollinger Band could come into play, right? Where, where do you think? Uh, trending, trending market. Yeah, like ju just normal tr range bound trending markets. But but on this chart, what I was getting at is, yeah, okay. Say the band gets close to the uh, resistance trend line, and that's the top of the band. But you like, you might be like, mm. well, okay. So what we've got is we've got a resistance level, right? And we might be looking at stochastics and going, okay, this is a bit overbought. Is there anything else that could tell me that this is that some traders might be like? getting short here as well. So what I would be looking at is potential levels where it does coalesce with the with the trend lines. That's where that is potentially a probability enhancer in that situation, right? Because we've got, you know, we've got our normal things. We've got the trend line. I've got um, momentum, which is stochastics. And then you can start to overlay things in here, right? Now, you could get addicted to that and just start like trading here in the middle of the range, trying to pick off like 10 or 15, 20 points on a day where you're just doing nothing. You could do it. Is it going to work for you? I'd say not. But where it could add, actually enhance your probability um, is incorporating the key aspects of what the traders, as in the traders at the banks are doing, and then what the sales guys are telling their corporates, right? So, um, and what I'm talking about is, where it gets close to these levels, funnily enough, when it gets close to resistance, it seems to be the top of the range or the bottom of the range anyway. Do you know what I mean? It's like yeah. we, so, our trend lines already sort of encapsulate the key aspects of it. Yeah, Mike? Uh, it, well, this, which you've got drawn out there, is almost like an extra confirmation uh, that's right. of, what, of what you're saying. Yeah. Yeah. So that, and that's why I sort of call it a, I could call it a, um, Confirmation enhancers, right? <laughs> that that, yeah. that, that yeah. could be a better name than probability because it, it is a confirmation. That, and that's all you're looking for sometimes, right? But yeah. but if you look at this enough, um, you'll be like, well, every time it gets close to the resistance trend lines, the Bollinger Band stops anyway. Uh, and that's right. because And this is a trending market, a sort of a range-bound market that's not really going anywhere. No violent data coming out and these sorts of things. So do you need it? Well, by looking at that, I can tell you, you probably don't. But if you were looking for that little bit of a confirmation enhancer, then that could be an opportunity as well, right? Now, there's some other ones here as well. Now, the, um, okay, so like one, one that I, I've never really, so one that's close to actually what we do here is using stochastics is MACD. Right, this has been around for it forever. I, I could never get my head around it. Um, there's sort of, sort of three major components, but it does use basically like stochastics, like a like a sort of moving average uh, line that, and it's but it's different to stochastics, right? And it's trying to tell you. Um, I, I actually, I almost sort of started to look at look this up, but I was like, you know what? I don't, I don't sort of get it. They're trying to coalesce whatever these things. Uh, down here, trying to incorporate three or four different things into one indicator. And, and to me, that's problematic because every indicator, not only do they generally lag, right? Stochastics is is like a as close as you're going to get to what is actually happening in the market. The rest of them have a bit of a lag where, you know, I don't even know, to be honest, the mechanics of the MACD, but I know people use that. And then they will also use Bollinger Bands. And last but not least, and this is where, like you don't want to confuse yourself is the last thing you want to do when you're looking for an opportunity. Now we use generally, uh, if I just come up here, let me just get on this one here and save. Okay, so we, we, we use longer term charts for trying to work out where the direction is. Okay, so that's one of the key aspects of of, of using uh, trend lines and trends, identifying trends on on um, your charts, is to work out what's where the direction is longer term. 
Now, so if I take, well, I'll leave that on there for the moment, but one other one that a lot of, um, I tell you, a lot of sales guys, and, and you know what, if you've been around a bit, they do a bit of um, uh, presentation skills or whatever they call it, you know, get on TV, you got to do some uh, work out how to talk and all these sorts of things. They do use a lot of moving averages, okay? And with that, they will, they, we used to sit, the guys used to sit behind us and, and I, I kid you not, they would get onto the, uh, their charts and things. Like here's a moving average here. They would actually get whatever, whatever was moving. And then, and like the TV station would say, okay, listen, we're going to ask you about Euro. Okay. So get yourself organized. And they're like, okay, no worries. The, um, they would come over here and fiddle around with their charts Right, trying to work out um, what with, with what moving average fits the story, right? They'd be going oh, up the fifty. What about that? And they'd like have two or three of them going through it, going, "Okay, give me the hundred. What does that look like?" <laughs> uh, no, 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 that's not good. And then, like they did, literally, and this is where we. I mean, it's hilarious, right? They're, like the dealing rooms are big joke houses. Like the traders, we sit there all day. You're looking around. You're like, mate, you don't even know what you're doing. And they <laughs> and they'd be like, just shut up, would you? They don't tell anyone. But they they would find a moving average that fits the story. Now they used to put these guys when they did the TV presentations, right? You you've probably seen this a hundred times, um, where they do it near the dealing rooms. Well, they used to do it near the traders. They stopped doing that many years ago, probably before the turn of the century, because we would shout out like different things like bullshit, like all this sort of stuff, right? Because the guy doesn't even know what he's talking about. So he would have some moving averages and he'd be saying, you know what, the uh, euro's going um, going down at the moment, you know, the the 50 day or the 100 day or the 20 day, the 14 day moving average comes in at 17. That's probably where it's going to top out. Uh, we don't see it going much above the band and, and all these different things. It was a story. But Take out the story. There are some things um, like on a long-term chart, right? This sort of one here. If I come into the moving average here, there are some where you want to know if it's going up or down. And this is where I would incorporate potentially something like a 200-day moving average just to try and, okay, overall, this is what traders used to do. Don't forget, we used to used to do this stuff on, on uh, charting graph paper. So if it was above the 200-day moving average, we would sort of generally say it's going up well, or the trend is up. So if someone asked us, yeah, it's up. If it went back down through the 200-day, we would be saying it's down. Now, are these tradable levels? Well, sometimes they are. But you know what? If you drew trend lines, they'd probably line up with those. But so we use as a general indication, right? And once again, all of these indicators, it's just an indication of what's going on. No, obviously, if they were exact, we would actually be killing it. Um, but that's that's what we used to be doing there, right? So on a long term basis, we would be saying, you know what, the um, the instrument's going up or down, right? And then on top of that, used to be able to you probably add another one for a shorter term basis, um, and that could be uh, what have we got here, uh, like you know. On a short-term basis, maybe 50, okay? And then you could sort of say short-term, it's going up. Longer-term, it's going down, right? That's the sort of stuff you would do that. But having that on your charts, you can actually see it when you draw trend lines. Or like I was showing um, you guys the other day, these trend channels are, are like indicators, right? And it's a visual indication of, of what the instrument is doing. I'd be more inclined, and this is when I was adding some of these and talking to the guys about this, I'd be more inclined to have some uh, trend channels in there so you can sort of see visually what's happening. It's more of a trigger for if it does break out. Like, as I was saying um, yesterday, Dollar Cad still wants to go down, I think, but uh, we're not, just not getting that, that final push. Um, these are indicators. Right, it's an indication of what's currently happening and, and where it will sort of break out. And a lot of these trend channels, they are tradable trend lines. Right, if I take off the trend channel here, 
you'll find a trend line behind it, right? That this is actually a trend line. So when you come into looking at um, uh, your analysis, right? I'm looking for like things that are actually mean something to me as far as a trading opportunity goes. And this, this is very much a part of it, right? So, and I can come into that and extend right. And then you can see exactly where it is, right? And that sort of tells me what's going on. Yeah. Okay, Brad, I have a question here. Okay, right, right on that channel you just had. Yeah. Okay, now we're sitting uh, right on support uh, as the trend channel. Mm -hmm. Would you consider taking a trade there, even though we, we've got the trend channel, the like the real one? Uh, at 133 or 134 there, like right there. Yeah. Oh, okay. Consider, so yeah, you've got the, would you, got, you consider shorting that there? Well, this is the thing, Mike, it's, it's one of those ones where like, to me, if you're looking at the overall massive trend, it's, it's sort of just sideways, right. In a, in a pretty yeah. big range a 400 point range, there is a potential, right. Where, and this is funny enough where the, the, um, the inflation numbers yesterday, sort of came into play. You know, you'd think with strong numbers, this would go down, but it's like the market wasn't really expecting it. Otherwise, we wouldn't have seen the violent price action. But, you know, now there's no data. It is starting to get a bit oversold. I would consider it, right? But sometimes... Or even going long there. I mean, either or. Well, break down or, it down. Or... Yeah, breaking back into the range. Yeah, yeah. potentially. But what I would have yeah. to consider, I would always consider, okay, 138. Now that's 140 points away. Yeah. Plenty of time to make some cash there. Uh, yeah. It's a bigger move to the downside. So once again, the um, you know you, you, these are all sort of basic indications of what's going on. We're trying to refine the trade here. And on a long-term basis, you probably want to consider the short-term um, setup of the various instruments, right? So if I came in and looked at Dollar Cat in particular, I'd, I'd be like, well, this thing is sort of like... I yeah, mean, it's just... The price action there, that last price action is nasty, right? That's yeah. that's just nasty. And there's a key aspect, obviously, as we know, with dollar CAD, oil is sort of falling here, which is taking dollar CAD up, right? So yeah. that's it. That's like you you'd probably know more than most, Mike. The the loony is um more influenced by oil by a sort of commodity than most other currencies. Yeah. Um in the day. Aussie was was really pushed around by gold. You can sort of track Aussie with gold. Uh, then it became copper. And, but that's sort of neither here nor there sometimes. But oil, I mean, oil and CAD is, is uh, they're joined at the hip. So so coming back to, you, to your charts, right, and you're looking at various opportunities here, what I'm sort of saying is you can experiment with various indicators, right? And with the... Uh, uh, indicators themselves. Oh, actually, one, one thing I wanted to come back to is touch on, which uh, Leonard has been using is, uh, well, I'll get my other charts up, are uh, the Fibonacci's, right? And um, I was just talking to Leonard the other day about, um, you know, Fibos, and he's done a, a couple of courses on Fibonacci's, and that's all he, he was sort of trained on. He's like, well, this doesn't make sense to me. And it didn't sort of really work. But now he's drawing trend lines He's fine with the current market conditions that the Fibos are sort of coming into play. So, and this is the thing, right? All these indicators and like a lot of different indicators are for specific market conditions. If you knew exactly the market conditions that you were looking at on your chart, you could pull one of them off the rack and stick it in there and it could enhance or confirm uh, the probability or, or the likelihood of the trade sort of working out. That's the sort of fact of it is, but they're, they're all different and the markets are super dynamic. So if I came into um, looking at Fibonacci retracements, right? Uh, and you're just sort of having a look across the, the board here to say, get this one up here on Euro. Like, let me just uh, extend those right. Okay, I haven't really sort of seen the colors here on this one before, but it looks pretty groovy. Um, so looking at the various sort of colors here, you, you start to sort of see where it's, it is stopping and starting. This is something that you can, you know, there's, there, there is a, a big community of traders using Fibonacci's. For me and for most traders on the teams, it was more 
it was a it was a something we did when we had no trend lines, things were trending, and we didn't even know where they were going or how or what the potential was. And this is where the retracements or the projections could really come into play, right? So from this move to from the high to the low, then you can start to see where a few of these levels are. And uh, you know, like it's not exact an exact science. Like you can see that here it sort of chops straight through. And this is the thing, you, you, you can cherry pick this and just go, well, I'll trade that one, trade that one. But how do you know which one is going to be doing what? Funnily enough, once again, where, where do these things, where would it work best, Mike? What do you think? Right on the trend lines. On the trend lines, man. This is it. Like, So you can, yeah. actually, you can actually have a fiddle here if you're doing sort of nothing. And then you go, yeah, in the middle here, it's a bit, doesn't work there. Um, and fundamentally, obviously, a big move straight down there. A uh, bit of a barroom brawl there. I mean, it has held there, but that's, you know, you, you can't just sort of go, oh, you worked there, didn't work over there. But yeah. um, I can see, and this is the thing with some of these indicators, right? You draw enough lines, there'll be levels lining up somewhere. But the ones I'm really interested in is the ones where the, near the trend lights. That is yeah. a, if I'm looking to get into a trade, and if I come back, Mike, just, just on that, and we come back and have a look at the uh, say dollar cat on the on the longer term perspective, right? Well, actually, this is so. And this is the thing, right? With with Fibos, because you can where, where do you draw the line from? Do you draw it from here to this point? Yes, yeah. that's, that's the area we're looking at. But you know what? Usually, it would be the start of the trend, which is way over here. Or do you draw it from here to here because it fits in better? And that's yeah. the thing. People make indicators fit in. They, they shouldn't fit in. They should just be be there, right? So this would be a, a better one to be doing. If I just come down and I look for the retracement, this level here, or actually even up to here, or you can go to the high that it was just at. Now, if it's starting to come back down, right? And then you can start to get some levels there, right? And it's you can see it doesn't really work anywhere. And this is what the problem is. People will go, all right, well, you know what? I'll change it to this one. Um, and then you're like, well, that doesn't work either. I'll change it to this one. Oh, there we go. We've got something working. You know what I mean? It, it, if it doesn't like fit in naturally, then yeah. you're making it fit and you're actually fooling yourself. Well, I I, I know pe a couple of people who act, that's what, exactly what they do is they make it fit to, to make it work in their own hands. But it doesn't really mean anything. No, that's right. <laughs> like, who's looking at it besides <laughs> yourself? And it's like, yeah, yeah. Like, dude, you, you, you're kidding yourself. Um, so once again, you could draw something like that and you go, you know what? Is it breaking up or down? Where's that trend line? It's just sort of here. It's sort of in between. Um, yeah, it's it's what would be good. And this is actually the biggest indicator out there, right? Is um, you guys should know it. Our good friend. Uh, the, the Ichimoku cloud, yeah. right? Yeah. That is the biggest indicator in the market. And why does it work? Because that is technical analysis for, for Japanese traders. It's almost like if we globally had, we just used the Ichimoku cloud, tra like analysis, market analysis would be so much easier, right? Because we were just like, well, this is, I can see it. And everyone's looking at the same thing. So that's why the yen crosses uh, such good trading instruments when they are in play. Like I know now, this is the thing, right? So even looking at the hourly charts, the um, the crosses are coming back into play now that there's a bit more rhetoric around, you know, potentially jumping in at 160 on, on dollar yen. So you want to have your charts up. And this is something like, and this is quite serious. You could be you putting orders on the... Um, on your cloud every day, right? And what what would be the smart one is is just a break trade, okay? Because if the BOJ come out and do something, it's just going to go down, right? And that's where you want to get set. The uh, I mean, I picked up like four and a half grand on a trade about a month or two months ago. Um, I put the trade on about five or six days early. I totally forgot all about it on Sterling Yen, and it sort of crapped out. I took I, I found it. I went. Jesus, this is, oh, wow, I'm in a trade here. Took the cash and then it sort of probably went about 15, 20 points lower and then 
over the course of the next week went up another 300 points. Um, but you don't need to be in front of the screens because everyone's looking at it, right? And when it breaks the cloud, it breaks. Um, so that is that is an indicator that works because it's got critical mass. So when you come back and you're looking for probability enhancers yourself, you need the ones that everyone's looking at. And that this is the problem, right? And who's looking at them? Because if it's just all the retail traders, well, you know what? That may not be so cool, right? And you can see, I, I can genuinely see here, you know, where the cloud, I mean, as I said, you're cherry picking here because I have to go, yeah, that one there, maybe it went straight through there. Well, it's gone, like hasn't hasn't stopped anywhere except here, sort of stopped there and there. Like three out of about 15 that got right. Okay, so are you going to be using it, uh, these indicators? Like what you what you would do is, I should get Leonard on here. He's not here today, but um, you say, okay, Leonard, well, you show me where you're using this and we'll see see how logical it is. Um, because when you are looking across the board, it's great to have a confidence uh, booster in there. Um, whether it's a moving average or not, the moving average is to me just telling, telling tell us if it's going up or down. The best indicators, right, that we use are trend lines, okay? That's an indication of where the liquidity is and where momentum will shift. And that's, that's a global phenomenon that has been around since I started or before I sort of started, you know, and that's handed down from senior traders to the junior traders. I was telling someone this the other day, like they're like, how do you know that this is how it works? Because, because I worked in the banks for 20 years, but, and they're like, well, what does that mean? The, I'm like, well, you get trained by the older traders. But the funny thing is with technical analysis, and this is um, like the older traders don't want to do all the training. So there used to be, technical analysis firms, particularly out of the States, would come over, there would be about 30 to 50 junior traders, like graduates and junior traders. And we would go to like a week session on technical analysis and we were all taught the exact same thing. And then you go back and over the course of your career, you teach that stuff to the, to the youngsters that are coming through. And that's how this is all handed down, right? That's why it's, that's why everyone does the same because it's like there's no reason to change it. It's, this is exactly the way uh, the bankers look at it. The fund managers do their technical analysis, everyone, because we were all at the same courses doing the exact same thing. So these are your, these are your indicators. Um, what all I could suggest to you is um, have a bit of a fiddle, right? And you can like come in and add things. I actually added this chop zone. I don't even know what it is, but it looked uh, a little bit crazy down the bottom here. The um, You can research some of this stuff. I, I don't I do not do it. One that um, one of the guys I work with uh, used to use this parabolic stop and reverse, right? But he was a very small trader and he would generally, let me, have you seen this before? Yeah, I've seen it. Yeah, yeah. Like he would get sort of, like he'd have a very tiny position because the room for getting stopped out was quite large, but he would hold the position until, you know, it, it stopped doing this and this thing came up, right? He'd, he'd make a couple of grand every day. I can tell yeah. you in a bank, they want to see more than a couple of grand every day, right? The and But he, could, he, he didn't feel comfortable putting more than a couple of million bucks on it because it was, it was like a bit flighty. Once again, in quiet market conditions, this can really work. But once again, where does it work? At the bloody support and resistance levels. Yeah, yeah. You know what yeah, I mean? Yeah, some of the people, that, a couple of people I know that, that live and die by this one, uh, they get in about the third or fourth dot. And then uh, when the, you know, and then they get out when the, when the top one, say say you're going up, you're getting in about the third, third or fourth dot. And then when the first one appears above, that's when they get out wherever, you know, wherever it is. Yeah, that's right. And, and instead, looks, instead of the first dot, and like if you see the first dot, yeah. you're not getting in right there. Well, that's that's right. And and sometimes these things can uh, change direction after a few dots. Yeah, so that's the problem. But you know, you you look at it, and you're like, wow, I love I love the visual, right? I love it. Yeah. The, and this thing here, you, you know, see how this price action is going down. This thing's still here. You might, well, yeah, maybe it's got more room. This thing hasn't sort of turned the other way yet. So. The, 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 I, I put 
credibility in a lot of the indicators, but only on a certain scale. And that's why I would use them, as you sort of mentioned, your terminology there, Mike, like a confirmation enhancer. Yeah. But that could be like, like the funny thing is like the indicators, right? So this is topped out. It's like one, two, three, maybe three, four hours later, this thing's popped up. And it's, and so if you wait for the fourth one, and you're down here, it's, where are we there? So you're looking at, uh, say, 111.25. Okay, so that's like 100 points. You're, you're missing the bolt, first half mm -hmm. of the trade. So, but that's the thing. These things lag, right? They, they lag for a reason because it doesn't look good if it's if it's real time. It, it sort of makes sure, but you're missing the bulk of the trade at the start. But, you know, who am I to argue with the people who are using it? Because once you get into these indicators, it becomes addictive and you've got to spend a lot of time in front of the screens, generally speaking. Um, you mean, you could have a trailing stop on these parabolic stop and reverses, but uh, you know what? It's, it's almost like uh, following, if you look at the stochastics, right? This is what we used to do is go, well, that actually sort of co coincides with stochastics, but see how fast stochastics is to turn there on when momentum drops, like this thing is, you know, really getting into play down here. I'm actually looking at, um, now I've got a bit more, I'll have a bit more time, is actually sort of building almost trendline trader to be using the, some of these, not, not some of these stochastics, more like using um, stochastics, I, I was going to say, because there, there's more, there's more gorgeousness in here. Now I cover this in the course, but I sort of, it's not rushed through, but there's not enough focus on it. And that's probably because of just market conditions and everything's violent. We get these inflation numbers or employment, everything moves dramatically and stops. But, you know, when, like as an indicator, this, this stochastics has a lot of different features, right? So what we used to do aggressively is when these lines got above the 80 Mark, we would sort of almost start selling, like right, just aggressively to try and hold it back. But really the ideal point, there's, there's two ideal points to sell. Up here is high risk when it, when these lines just start to go across the, um, the 80 level. When they cross over, it's a, it's a bit better, right? But the best time to be selling stochastics is when they go, both of them go back below 80, right? But this is very much like the parabolic stop and reverse. If you look at that, we're sort of not getting in here probably till over here. And you've missed, once again, you've missed the move. So we use it as a general indication. Okay, it's overbought. Um, don't get sort of carried away of being long. We may have to sort of get out here at some stage. But when this thing breaks down here, it's a pretty sure bet that it is going down. You just miss the first major part of the move. Okay, so, and and the problem is, like, we treat these the stochastics with a bit of disrespect as well, because, you know what, it can, and I was just saying there, when these things cross over, it's a great time to be um, getting short, but then who's to say it doesn't just trade sideways from there, and then goes down, like a full, you know, six, eight hours later, you're sitting there short, right? That's what I'm saying. So you could actually be a little bit more patient, wait for it to go down here um, through back through those um, major levels, the 80 or 20. And so what I'm thinking of doing is, is building trendline trader or to set up a, like a sell order, but that only sells when it goes back down through those levels or, or up through the levels here on the, um, you know, up through 20 when it's over, oversold. Right. I think that, and, and what I'm trying to do is I'm just trying to, take advantage of opportunities. If I was sitting in front of the screens, would I be doing it? Well, once again, it comes down to specific market conditions. If there's nothing happening over a day or two, no key data coming out, like secondary, third sort of data, that's when I would be using this, right? But once again, mm -hmm. trying to use, get it close to a trend line. So the ideally, right, this one here, let me just clear that. And this is where you want your indicators to work, right? You want your... Hitting the uh, sorry, hitting the resistance level, it's over overbought, and you know what? This could be the trigger level as long as it's say I look at the trend line, 
if I'm within 20 points or 25 points of the trend line, execute a sell order as it's going down, right? That's, that's me putting indicators into play. Um, and that's sort of just, and that's sort of more like uh, automating my sort of trading process based off uh, a sideways moving market that I don't think is going to break out of the range. So that once again, specific market conditions. The key of the trend lines as being indicators, these things are here, right? They're here the whole way through once we start drawing them. So we don't have to worry about anything else. We are trying to get other things to confirm. I like your term, Mike. Uh, confirm our, our probability or likelihood of um, like confirmation, right? This thing here, like it's a bit over, over uh, sold, but not enough at this stage. Drifting sideways, which you know what, funnily enough, just matches up with the current price action. So you, I wouldn't be getting looking to get long there, and I wouldn't really be getting looking to get short. I, in fact, I just wait because we have the luxury of waiting for the setups. The problem is we've got lives, right? We've got work to do, we've got family to do, we've got friends to see, we've got things on. So you don't want to spend all, all day in front of the screens. Ideally, we want to set up. Um, like either alerts on these things or or something like basically let you know that it's there. And if you're in front, if you get a chance to be in front of the screens, go and have a look. Um, that's what I've started to do a bit more is is not necessarily an indicator, but if I've got a trend line over the and I want to be, I want to know if it's getting close to a trend line, whether it's support or resistance, I'll set a trade alert up for it to email me, text me, so I can actually um Go, all oh, right, it's at that level. If I'm around, I'll go and check out what's going on. And and that enables me to come back, like instead of sitting in front of the screens, come back at a specific time when it's at a certain level. And then I can go, you know what? This is either overbought, oversold. Uh, is it going with the trend and these sorts of things? And then I can get into the trade. And that's sort of indicators. You know what? They are good tools. Right conditions for the right indicator can really um, add to your confirmation enhancement. You know, one thing, Brad, when I first started this whole thing, uh, and I was probably just like everybody else, you just load your charts with indicators. You got five or six indicators. You got moving averages all over the place. And then you find, well, okay, what is this one? What's this one telling me? What's this one telling me? What's it? And they're all telling you something different. And yeah. you just want to go bang your head against the wall because now you haven't got a fucking clue what you're doing. That, that is actually a really key point. Like when you're using indicators, don't go and use three or four because you're exactly right, Mike. They will tell you different things and you will have no idea which one to believe. And if you've got four on a chart, yeah, likelihood is one of them will work. And then you'll go, I'll use that one. And then you're like, that doesn't work. And then you're back. You're just chasing your ass. And this is yeah. the story of most, I don't like the term retail trader, but say, uh, non-professionals or novices they just because they've got no idea what trend lines are they've got no idea how the how to predict what's going on they don't even know the fundamentals exist right they yeah. use indicators to try and tell them when to buy or sell and it's a there's a massive market for it like people are selling shit that is just terrible um so and, and the, the, just on that just to finish up with a lot of the the custom built indicators what they do is, and the markets are extremely dynamic, right? They're always changing with what's happening in the market. Central banks, uh, international events, geopolitical events, or whatever it might be. They get an instrument, whatever it might be, it could be sterling. They will go back and look at, back test everything. And, and they'll go, okay, build an indicator that worked. It's like finding uh, the, the, what lines up with the Fibonacci's. And they will back test it and go, and then they will market it, get it out, uh, we back tested this. You would have made thirty grand had you used it, but you know what? It, the conditions they looked at were completely different, and they know that, but they don't give a shit. They just go and sell it and say this is what you need to be doing because um, this indicator made money, but they don't tell you the conditions it was in. If that's yeah. anyway, that's the problematic aspect of it. People want to make money, and they've got no idea what they're doing, so they use indicators for their primary um, trade execution. Now, what the bankers are doing, they've got trend lines, they've got stochastics, 
And sure, they will, and they will start having a look around different indicators once again to confirm um, as a confirmation enhancement. I love it. The um, and that's where you can use the indicator. So, like you know, when I first came out of the banks and we started doing these things, I was bashing up indicators, right? Because I'm like, oh my god. But you know what? There is logic to them. Like, and this is why people use them because one out of every ten they will get right. But unfortunately, they run out of money. You've got no capital management on top. So, but you can't, that they are good as an enhancer, um, but not as your primary um, source of, of trading uh, decision, right? So just, just bear that in mind. And if you do find some good ones that are working, we'll post them on the Discord. Let us know. We'll have a look and go, you know what? Because at any specific time, if you find one that's working quite nicely, it might work for like a day or two, right? And then, and it's like, I'm, I'm sort of embellishing it a bit, but what it can do is it can help if you're looking at a specific trade, well, you can make anything fit the story. So if you went through all the indicators, you'll probably find one that actually matches up and you go, yeah, there it is. That works. But so take it with a grain of salt, but um, they are out there and it's worth exploring. Put it that way. Any questions there, guys? Uh, no, the message is clear that how this indicators works. No, no question. Yeah, cool. If you have any questions as we go forward, like jump on the uh, on the Discord because we can come back and actually have further discussions around this. Um, you know what? I'm here to listen to what traders are using and what what they do. Whether if 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 it's if it's got credibility to it, I'll uh, I'll be sure to be looking at it and potentially using it. Right, so don't be afraid to um, ask questions. You're not a bad person for using indicators. It's uh, just make sure you understand that their limitations, and um, then you're in a position to potentially use them. All right, all right, guys. Thanks for joining us. Uh, that, I just wanted to ex sort of explain the using indicators and and what they do and, and how they can sort of guide you. I think Mike mentioned it. The most important thing is if you have too many on your charts. You're going to get completely confused. Understand for most of them, there's at least a three to four hour time lag from the time the market moves to them telling you what to do. And that's the biggest problem. That's why we use stochastics. It's real time momentum based off price action. So whereas the others, like uh, we saw on the par parabolic stop and reverse, you, 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 you're probably waiting three hours to get the first one. And if you're waiting another three hours, you're six hours into the trade, you really need a long-term trade to be getting into that. Otherwise, you're just going to get flushed out on the daily price action. All right, guys. Thanks for joining us. I'll get this up on the site. And uh, hopefully, I'll have some good news about the members back end. You'll have all the uh, good things coming up. Thanks. Have a good day. Yep. Thanks, Brad. Cheers, Thanks. guys.